Hey everybody, it's Craig Syracuse, Walk in Faith. Yes, we are back again at the Opera House in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the Emmaus Center. Thank God we are ready, we are open. But today's exciting. I'm sitting down with my friend, Linda Roselle. We're gonna discuss her new book, Journeys with the Tin Can Pilgrim. Linda, thank you so much for coming all the way to Brooklyn. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was an adventure. Thank you for having me. I must say this Emmaus Center is absolutely stunning. Thank it's you. It's just beautiful. It is fascinating. It was built in the 1800s, remodeled Monsignor Hernandez, Bishop DiMarzio, Monsignor Jamie have been behind it, and it is spectacular. Well, it's lovely, and, and being here is really an honor. Thank you so much. And it gave me the opportunity to grow in trust in God mm. on the way here because I had to tow my 19-foot Airstream over the Verrazano Narrows Bridge wow. and through the uh, Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So that was a new experience wow. for me with the Airstream. That's difficult for anyone. And, and so, yes, God was with you on that journey. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, mutual friend Carl, told me about the story. I, I started to reflect and think about it. I made the joke. It was really that day I was setting up my fourth shed in my yard. Uh -huh. I accumulate so much stuff and I'm reading the book, I'm reflecting on that and I blame it on my wife that she collects, it's really me. But I'm thinking about the book, reading about it, and especially the part where you said, you know, you only have like one or two, say, wine glasses and maybe two spoons and you have to get rid of all of your stuff and detachment. And I'm thinking, I'm like, can I do that? So how does an antitrust lawyer from DC, when I love the term you use, it's sticks and bricks. How do you go from sort of giving that all up to now living in a 19 foot Airstream? It was easier than it sounds. And one of the reasons is it really was in response to a call from God. And so I was at a point in my life where I was facing becoming an empty nester because my children were grown. And I also had finished the major projects that I had been hired to work on for a small nonprofit in the Virginia suburbs of DC. Before that, I had retired from my job as an antitrust lawyer. So I was just doing a little bit of legal work in as in-house counsel for the nonprofit. And I was at this point where I just didn't know where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do in the next stage of my life. So I gave it all to God mm -hmm. and I said, Lord, here I am, what would you like me to do? Whatever it is, I'll do it. And that is a very dangerous prayer. But boy, does he give you the graces to, uh, <laughs> to follow what he asks you to do. And so he put it on my heart to sell everything I had, including my townhouse, which was a 2,500 square foot townhouse in a very desirable area of Northern Virginia. I quit my job and I bought an Airstream and a truck and wow. learned how to drive a truck, a Ram 1500, after having driven a Mazda 3 for most of, most of my recent history. It's interesting because, you, you know, Discernment, I mean, that, that takes a lot. And I've learned too recently about when I pray, I have to be very specific, you know, on how I ask and what I ask for and how I pray. Because regardless if God answers or not, that is the answer. If it doesn't always work in my favor, that's fine. That's the way God answers. I know you were raised Catholic, and then I think it was 13, you know, that, that sort of difficult conversation where you made the sacraments, but, you know, I guess you sort of separate or walked away or you weren't as engaged, I don't know the word you use, but what happened in your life that sort of reconnected you to your faith? I essentially stopped going to church right after confirmation, which is uh, sadly not atypical. I uh, was very busy with my professional career and uh, with um, getting married and all sorts of things. And uh, anytime the Holy Spirit sort of gave a gentle knock at my door, I really didn't listen. Mm. What happened that really uh, spurred me to go back to church is that I was working at the law firm and a dear friend of mine who I had been in law school with and he'd recently gotten engaged, he was friends with both myself and my husband, he was on vacation mountain climbing in Argentina and he had a heart attack and died on the mountain at age 33. And I was devastated by that when I came back to the office and found out because the news came in in the middle of a work day. I went into my office, sat down and was just started talking to God really because I was so angry. I was like, how can somebody this good die so young? That's not fair. And I really felt a soft, still voice in my heart say, go to church and pray for him. Wow. And I did. <laughs> 
I went there and sobbed a lot in the pews mm. and resolved that I would start going to Mass. And then one thing followed from another. As I went to Mass, I learned a lot about the faith that I didn't know, including about the Real Presence, mm -hmm. which seems crazy because I went through CCD as a child, but I just somehow never got it, never absorbed it. And I eventually worked up the courage to go to confession mm. for the first time in 18 years. And boy, if you want to hear a priest be <laughs> happy. Like looking at his watch. Or oh, was... No, you go in and you say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been 18 years oh my since God. my last confession. And this priest was like, hallelujah, welcome home. <laughs> oh, no. But you, you mentioned earlier too about how that small, still voice. Yes. And now looking back, do you see that God was communicating and chasing you down? Absolutely. I, um, I remember that there were many occasions that sort of drew me closer to him. I, I broke a finger, which sounds very minor, but I had a bone tumor in the finger. And I was actually out for a while from work and it kind of got me off the merry-go-round where I started mm -hmm. taking time to think and reflect. And I remember when I was going to physical therapy, I, um, I would pass a sign at a Catholic church that said, inactive Catholics, we welcome you back. That stuck in my head, I remember that. And when I eventually did go back, that's where I went because, mm. you know, it was kind of scary to come back after being away for a long time. And then I was worried, well, is this gonna look weird? I'm here by myself, my husband isn't into this, but it was all fine. And, mm. and like you said, when you're peaceful and quiet, God really normally doesn't whack us over the head with a two by four. I mean, he, he really does speak quietly and he speaks through other people. So I started, after I embarked on the road, I started writing a travel blog about visiting shrines and religious sites because people kept asking me if I was going to do a blog. And I started feeling in prayer like, oh, God, do you want me to do a blog? Is this why this topic keeps coming up? And I felt sure that it was. So I do a non-commercial blog where I just write about the beauty of God in nature and I write about shrines and religious sites and I try to make it appealing to people who are religious and people who are not religious so that there might be a little nugget that someone mm -hmm. can take away uh, and have that might plant a seed with them. Agree. Okay. When I became you know, I was always involved in the church, raised Catholic, but I really now am on fire for my faith. And it has to be about 12 years when I went to Fatima. Since then, my life has dramatically changed. But what happens is the people that you were brought up, could be family too, mm -hmm. they know me as the old Craig. What happened in your life to when, when you started to build that relationship with Christ? Were you, was your family, your husband at the time accepting or were able to accept the new Linda? It was very difficult for the people who knew me because I had been very secular and very focused on professional success. And it really, it did cost me my marriage because uh, my husband was not able to accept this new person that I'd become. He wanted the 20 year old that he fell in love with and married, he wanted that woman back. As he put it, and I made this a <laughs> title of a section of the book, he felt that he married Gloria Steinem and woke up with Jerry Falwell. <laughs> that he, he just got mm -hmm. tired of the fact that I wasn't going to change back to the person I had been. And the fact that I was really making Jesus the center of my life. And so uh, that wasn't what he signed up for. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we didn't have a truly Catholic marriage in that sense. And I did eventually get an annulment after he divorced me, but it was the restaurant where that, that scene kind of tugs at people's heartstrings because I went there thinking, oh, this mm -hmm. is great. We're going out on a date to a restaurant. And he had asked me to come to one of our favorite restaurants basically to tell me that he was done trying and we were gonna get divorced. Mm -hmm. So I've learned from that experience to really be careful in inviting people and not try to hit them over the head too hard. If you would have had a relationship with Christ, right? Looking back, let's uh -huh. say, and you were able to discern at the time do you think things would have been different? Would you still have, you know, went to law school? Do you think you still would be, would you be sitting here? Because things would have been very different. I really don't know. I might have been, I might have been called to the consecrated life if, if I had developed the kind of relationship that I have now with my Lord and Savior, because 
I mean, I, I don't feel lonely, actually. I mean, sometimes a little bit, and I'll call a girlfriend on the phone or another friend and chat for a bit, but I never feel like I'm alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I build what I'm doing. What I'm doing is only made possible by the fact that I pray a lot and that I go to, the, I frequent the sacraments. I try to go to confession weekly and to mass daily, if it, if it is at all possible, sometimes. I can't do that unless I'm going to drive for an hour and a half. It's just that in the circumstances of my ordinary life, I thought my plan was, well, maybe I should go and volunteer at another pro-life ministry. Maybe I should volunteer uh, my skills as a lawyer and do pro bono legal work. You know, all of these things seemed very logical. Uh, Buying a travel trailer and living in it and wandering <laughs> around the country and talking to people about God is not something I ever imagined I would do. But honestly, I am so happy doing this mm. because I know I'm doing what He wants me to exactly. do. And He makes each of us, Craig, for a purpose. Exactly. You know that. It's not and trying to force your agenda onto God and make the deals. And It's according to His plan, yes. not mine. Those simple words, and I remember too in CCD, maybe I wasn't paying attention. I went to Catholic school, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I remember always making deals with God, negotiating with mm -hmm. God. I swear, I swear, I'll, you know, if you, if you let this work. And the minute I surrendered, and you talk about that, which is so hard as a Catholic to say, I surrender. Mm -hmm. When you surrender your life and you give it to Christ, and I said, I'll do whatever you want, the doors opened. Right. And there was no agenda, there's nothing beneath that. It's whatever you want me to do. If you don't want me to be here, fine. Mm -hmm. And then you, you sort of release that control, but that's not what society says. That's not what the, the kids are using. I need to control everything. But when you give your life to Christ, when you surrender it over, there's this sense of peace. Same way, you don't know where you're going to be in a week from now, or two weeks, or where right. you're going to plug in. I didn't know you, I was going to be here. Because <laughs> we, we can't recite those passages, right? God has me in the palm of his hand mm -hmm. and not truly believe it. If I believe that passage and I'm willing to say it, then I have to say, Wherever you want me to go, I'll do. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Mm -hmm. And you're living that. I say, I have it here. You're like a modern day apostle. You're spreading the gospel around the country. And I guarantee if you can go to another country with that, which I don't know if you can, you would. There are so many people on the road who are full-time nomads. And this is what I thought, you know, in his providence, this is the little niche that he's given me, which is to go and minister to people who live full-time on the road. And by minister, I don't mean that I walk up and I say, hi, I'm Linda Roselle, and I'm here to tell you why you should give your life to Christ. And there's nothing wrong with that approach, but that's not the one he called me to. The one that he called me to is simply to be a friend to people and to listen and mm -hmm. be present. and also, you know, to be true, to mm. witness to what I believe. And so you don't know what kind of seed that is that you That's planted. That's exactly right. You said it. And the Holy Spirit and other people that God brings into that person's lives are the ones that are going to cultivate that seed yep. and see it grow. And you may never know mm. what that is. I think on very rare occasions, which I do talk about in my book, In Journeys with a Tin Can Pilgrim. I talk about um, the occasional times where I was able to see something more, where I, a friend of mine introduced me to a friend of theirs, um, long distance, and I went to visit her at her campsite and we talked. And she and her husband actually followed me to a shrine I was going to because they hadn't been to confession in a long time. They ended up going to confession when they hadn't been in a very long time, and then they made plans to come back and talk to the priest about marriage counseling. So that was a rare instance where, you know, he kind of said, here, you know, give you something here's a little bit, because there aren't any metrics. No, there's, Absolutely uh, there's none. no KPI in the Holy Spirit. No. Nope. No KPI. You said it too, present. Mm -hmm. I mean, in every passage, it's his sitting there with the one person being present, listening. And it, I think it's harder to live out our faith it's easy to say, I can, mm -hmm. oh, but if I'm living a different life, the actions, my deeds, my words, they all need to be in line to work towards being holy, right? right. So I want people to see me and go, I'm the same as you. Say, there's something different about that person. Mm -hmm. And then I, that's the seed. But if I'm proclaiming the gospel and acting a different way, it's a contradiction. I'm not representing my faith or Jesus Christ the right way. I want people to see there's something different. And a friend of mine used this term. He said, we're like mailmen. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, we drop the mail, but the mailman never waits to see if you paid the bill. 
you're on to the next person. So you plant the seed and you leave. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's so interesting. And he's like, that's how I minister, is I just plant it and I right. go. Because we don't know, like, so there's no KPI. There's no way I'm going to know if I plant the seed. We just do what we're called to do. Right, and, and we fail sometimes. I mean, I fail all the time. There's a reason I go to confession just about every week, because I make mistakes. I miss opportunities to talk to people. There's always something to do when you're traveling on the road. Things break on the RV, you're meeting new people, you make plans to do things. And you can get busy even with something that's very good like even with volunteer work, you mm. can get very busy and slip into not making that one-on-one -on -one prayer time. But that one-on-one -on -one prayer time is so essential. You're quiet and you listen to him. It becomes a two-way conversation. It's not just reciting prayers by rote exactly. or checking some boxes like, yes, I prayed my rosary today, so I'm good. But it's actually trying to meditate upon it and see, listen and ask him, what are you trying to show me? How yes. does this passage from the readings at Mass apply to my life today? That's, that's right, it's listening. And I think a lot of people, I always generalize people, and, and we do something similar. I do a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. sweep. I, I love to rake the leaves. Anything manual labor where I'm meditating and praying and listening. Because mm -hmm. what happens is we pray. I prayed 15 minutes in the morning, but then I'm on my Day. There's no time for God to speak to me and for me to reflect on that. So if I'm just praying out of the, you know, part of the routine of my day, but I'm not allowing God to speak to my spirit, you got to just, and for me it works, it's just raking the leaves and listening to what God says. Just even if I don't want to hear it, I want to listen. And reading scripture, let him, let scripture be right. revealed within my spirit. Because you can read the same passage 10 times and it applies to me differently. I'm like, this was past week, it was James, right? And, and, and I was like, good works. And I always think about the good works. And, and, and just the way the what's happening in society now, I always reflect on those passages. Mm -hmm. Am I doing enough? Do people know that I am a Christian? Am I carrying the cross? Like those are the things I constantly reflect on and it's by being alone with Christ, by reading scripture. It's the intention and the effort with which you do something, not the result that really, really matters. That's right. That is detachment. That's spiritual detachment. That's not getting so caught up and set on your own goals and your own understanding of what those goals are, that you're not willing to change what you're doing. When I'm learning for the first time how to uh, dump the tanks on my RV or how to back into a spot or how to tow, you know, God was there with me and I bring him into the lessons that I have on how to do this. So someone who's not interested necessarily in religion, but is very interested in RVing, they can read my book and they can get a lot out of it in terms of how to do this, how, how to be in an RV. I have a little checklist that makes it simple for them. Um, but if you're at all open to developing a deeper relationship with your creator, at whatever point you're approaching that, the book is filled with invitations to go mm -hmm. deeper. And I have some passages you know, that are very overtly religious and trying to encourage people to reflect and ask themselves questions about uh, when did I experience something very difficult in life that ultimately something good came out of and where was God in that mm. and uh, encouraging them to do things like pray and explaining how to pray that it is really a conversation yes. you have to leave room for for God to act and respond. No, I agree. And even from, from like I've thought about maybe renting an RV and it has like those, like you said, the checklist. I think the book is fantastic. It's some, it's a book that I can read for a, say, a religious purpose, but I can also read if I was, you know, about to take a trip with my family and I had some questions that I didn't know who to ask. So just one last question. Has there been, say pre-COVID, post-COVID, has there been an increase in people sort of you know, giving up the white picket fence and that whole theory of I need to own a home and sort of becoming a nomad or living mm -hmm. on the road. Have you seen Absolutely. an increase? Absolutely. It's a huge increase because for one thing, people learned that they can work remotely during the pandemic. So a, there are a lot of people on the road and that has increased dramatically too in the past year with the pandemic. It provides a very easy and safe way to travel in a sense because you're cooking your own food, you have your own sanitary facilities. You can be pretty isolated if you want to be isolated. You get to see absolutely gorgeous sights. Mm. I mean, the, the number of 
parks and beautiful areas in our country are just amazing. So I think also when people are feeling this sense of uncertainty and it helps them, they feel a yearning for something and they may not identify that as a yearning for God. Sometimes they identify that as a yearning for freedom, as a yearning for seeing the beauty of the country and traveling. But within that yearning, there really is a yearning for God. Can you share with us some of your you know, contact or panels? Sure, sure. I, my blog is tincanpilgrim.com and then I have a book uh, page, which is tincanpilgrimbook.com and that basically outlines where I'm going on my book tour, where I have different media appearances and it also has links to buy the book and to look at what some other people have said about the book. It's available on Amazon, both print on demand and in Kindle. And you can now go to your local bookstore That's great. and ask for the book because they can order it through, uh, the bookstore right. can order it through Ingram Spark or directly from the publisher, St. John's mm -hmm. Press. And guys, I would advise you to follow Linda, purchase the book, support Linda's ministry, you know, and, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Craig, for having me here. It's um, been a wonderful experience. My pleasure. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Walk in Faith. Always remember, you have the ability to inspire and evangelize through your words and actions. God bless you.